Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Well, I'm not Sheikh Mikhail. And I'm having some incredible deja vu at this moment because I feel the last, <laughs> right? The last Miftah event that we had here at MCC, I remember taking the mic and coming up here and saying, well, I'm not Sheikh Omar Suleiman. <laughs> MashaAllah, may Allah bless <laughs> all of the efforts and all of our teachers. May Allah bless them all. Actually, it's entirely my fault. Uh, the Miftah uh, program and the Miftah organization, may Allah bless them, reached out weeks ago, actually, with an invitation. And I had wanted to say yes, subhanAllah, but was meant to be traveling today. I actually wasn't supposed to be in the Bay today, subhanAllah. And the story gets even more interesting. Out of all the places I possibly could have been, I was meant to be in the place in which Sheikh Maka'il is actually now, <laughs> subhanAllah. Sheikh Mika'il is from Dallas, Texas, from Qalam. This is where he teaches and resides, subhanAllah. And this weekend at the Rahma Foundation, we were meant to have a women's conference in Dallas, Texas, <laughs> subhanAllah. With Dr. Haifa, yet her schedule changed, and so subhanAllah, that got canceled, and I am here, and Sheikh Mika'il is there, <laughs> alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. And as the brother said, we plan, and Allah plans, and Allah is truly the best of planners. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept from all of us and from this wonderful effort and from all of you. Allahumma ameen. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wa sallallahu ala al-hadi Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam ajma'in. All day today you have been talking about pathways to Jannah. Different types of pathways that enter you into Jannah. And subhanAllah we have reached the middle of Sha'ban. You walk outside, it is a full moon. That means we have two weeks upon us to Ramadan. When the month before Sha'ban, Rajab entered, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would make his special dua consistently. Allahumma barik lana fi Rajab. Wa barik lana fi Sha'ban. Allahumma balligna Ramadan. Oh Allah, put blessings in the month of Rajab and blessings in the month of Sha'ban and allow us to reach the month of Ramadan. Why just reach the month of Ramadan? Because if you could just witness it and enter it, you're good. <laughs> Inshallah. The blessings descend. SubhanAllah. But the scholars say to ready ourselves for Ramadan. We are given Rajab and Sha'ban. Rajab is the cleansing, the month of istighfar, forgiveness. And Sha'ban is the month of beautification. After you've taken your shower, you're meant to perfume yourself in Sha'ban to ready yourself to enter the month of Ramadan. How do you do so? With the salawat on the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This is a month of salawat, a month of sending our salams to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in order to then enter and enter, right? Stop right at the door of Ramadan and be able to witness all of its great blessings. So brothers and sisters, today what I chose, inshallah, in terms of the doorway that I want to share with you is a doorway that's familiar to all of us, but subhanAllah, the scholars say, it is not necessarily what everyone does, and that is Ramadan. Imam al-Ghazali says about Ramadan that there are three types of fasting. And he says that some people won't even reach the first level, but when they do reach the first level, normally it stops right there. And what is the first level of fasting? It is abstaining from food and drink. One time I was watching the news, the local news, and it was right around the time either Ramadan had just entered, it was the day before Ramadan, and the newscaster is saying on the news, the Muslim month of, and I thought she was going to say, the Muslim month of fasting is upon us. Muslims fast from sun up to sundown, and she's explaining this on the news. And behind her it says the words Ramadan. But then she says, it is the Muslim month of feasting. <laughs> and I thought, what? And I looked a little closer at the, tea, the screen, and sure enough, behind her head it said Ramadan, Muslim month of feasting. And I thought, la ilaha illallah. <laughs> Yeah, and subhanAllah, this is the image we have given to people. 
that this is what Ramadan is for us, a month of feasting. A month of feasting, subhanAllah. And then that tells us what Imam al-Ghazali was saying is accurate. That in order to really truly reach the blessings of Ramadan, it has to go well beyond not eating and not drinking. In Ramadan, subhanAllah, that first level is just the threshold. The next levels, he says, is the fast of the khawas. Who are the khawas? They are the elect. How do you fast the fast of the elect? He says, you fast from all five of your senses. You fast from what you see, the fasting of what you hear, the fasting of what this tongue says, the fasting of what you think, the fasting of what your limbs touch. This is the fasting of the elect. It's a higher level of fasting. It's a fasting that pushes us to understand it's not merely just leaving food and drink and intimacy in the daylight hours, but rather it is actually a full-on holistic fast of all five of our senses. And then he says, and then there's a third level of fasting. And this is the fasting of khawas and khawas. This is the elect of the elect, subhanAllah. And this is a high level, and when you hear it, you're going to say, oh, I don't know about that, subhanAllah. Because what is it? It's a fasting from anything other than Allah. It's not meant to make you feel bad or me. Rather, if you don't know what the aim is, what you're shooting for, then your threshold, your bar is very low, very, very low. And so we clap and we applaud ourselves for a while. I got through the day not eating and drinking. But subhanAllah, that is just the basic threshold. And so when we think about why Allah put this month in place, and I'll tell you something. I want to tell you about how to get through the door that is only for those who fast in Ramadan. What is that door called in Jannah? Babul. It is only for those who fast. Why? Because what Allah Azza wa Jal of the many, many, many wisdoms, divine wisdoms of why he had this month, one of which is the psychology of empathy. And that's what I want to focus on. See, we have these two terms in the psychological field. We have sympathy and we have empathy. Sympathy is at a distance. We are seeing a genocide unfold right in front of our eyes. Destruction, starvation, death and murder. And it's hard. And it hurts. And we are all tuned in because we're all witnessing what is happening through our phones. Virtually. And we're following and we're praying. And we're giving in charity, inshallah. But I'll tell you something that's missing. So far, everything we said is sympathy. It's at an arm's length where you say, Ya haram, masakin, pachara, pachari, ya haram. Empathy is different. Empathy is where you put yourself in the shoes of that person. What would it be like if? And Allah Azza wa Jal in his divine wisdom, he knows what he created. And he created us as humans to say, you are not going to understand what your fellow sister and brother in the ummah is actually feeling until you put yourself in their shoes actually. You do what they do. You do not eat and you do not drink and you feel the pangs of hunger. And only then have you truly understood what's happening with them. And only then do you love for yourself what you love for your fellow brother. The psychology of empathy. And Allah in his divine wisdom also does determined that a day is not sufficient, a week is not sufficient, a few weeks is insufficient, an entire month. Why? He knows. Jalla Jalaluhu. Until it becomes so part and parcel of who we are that you truly feel for your fellow sister and brother. And I'll tell you something. All that we're witnessing and all that we're watching right now is one thing. 
and then meeting the actual people who have experienced the genocide as something else. I'm gonna share something difficult and I'm gonna preface that this is difficult. Two weeks ago, I was at a conference in Qatar. It was an Islamic psychology conference. And before I traveled, some sisters contacted me and they said, we have here with us in Qatar a woman, a psychologist, a professor of psychology from the Islamic University of Gaza, the Jama al Islamiyah of Gaza. And she is a psychologist like you, and she wants to meet you. And I said, Of course, I'd be honored. Please, please ask her to come to the conference. They said, Look, we're going to warn you. She has a difficult story. I'm listening. They said, she is the only one out of her entire family who was pulled out of the rubble. When that building fell, everybody, mother, father, husband, children, siblings, nieces, nephews, everybody. And when they pulled her out and she realized she was still alive, she started crying. Not for them. She said, Ya Allah, what did I do that upset you so much that you didn't allow me to be a martyr like them? Ya Allah, what did I do that I couldn't be a shahida like them? Imagine. Fast forward to the conference. I'm there. It's lunchtime. We break. People are socializing and meeting each other. I'm saying salam to many people. And here comes a sister of the many sisters who are saying salam, and I'm saying salam to her. And then she says, and she stops and she says, Dr. Anya, I'm Shayma. Ahla wa sahla. I'm Shayma. I'm not, it's not clicking. Why? Huge smile on her face. Happy, happy person. And she keeps saying another and a third time. Dr. Rania, I'm Dr. Shayma Abu Sha'ban from Gaza. Oh, subhanAllah. I stop, freeze. Like, you know, when you're just like shocked. I couldn't even recognize her or understand that she was somebody who just weeks, just weeks prior, she was pulled out of the rubble. And here she is smiling. I say, please, please, let's sit down. And she sits down along with some of the other sisters and she begins telling her story. Ya Allah, what happened after this? She said, I had nowhere to go. My family is gone. My house is gone. My university is gone. Everything is gone, 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 gone. What, where do I go? She says to me, I went from house to house, to tent to tent, to place to place, to empty building, to empty hospital, to empty room, anything, anywhere I could find. I had no one. And I was hungry. And I was hungry. I was hungry and like a hunger you don't understand. She said, you don't understand how much salty water I drank. That's all that's available, just to survive. Salty water, salty water, salt. And no food. And when finally, finally, days later, somebody gave her a fourth, a fourth of a piece of bread. She said it was like they put a gold bar in my hand. That's what it was like. And she took the first bite. And then she said, I got so distracted, I started taking pictures of the bread. That's how long I hadn't seen bread or touched it or eaten it. She goes from place to place until finally she gets a call. And the call is, you have no family. And here are some children who are parentless, who also don't have any family, and who are injured. Accompany them to Qatar for medical treatment. So she becomes the surrogate mother, if you will, of a little girl who has casts on each of her four limbs, who needs to go for medical treatment and physical rehab. And she becomes like her mother in Qatar. And that's what she was doing there. And they said to her, Allah, you keep asking why Allah didn't take you as a martyr. 
yet. However, there is a reason why Allah still wants you on this earth. There is still something he needs from you that is not done yet. The fact that she's a psychologist, when she went there, all of these parentless children, she started to work with them. And you know what her, subhanAllah, you know what her specialty in psychology was at the university? Trauma. Trauma of warfare. So she's taken on these children. I said to her, Dr. Shema, you have to tell your story to the world. Next week, as was announced, Friday and Saturday of next week, I'm hosting at Stanford the annual Muslim Mental Health Conference. It happens once a year in different universities. This year we're hosting it at Stanford because it's the 10-year anniversary of my lab, alhamdulillah, shukrillah, the Muslim Mental Health and Islamic Psychology Lab. And I said to her, Dr. Shema, we have a panel on Palestinian mental health amongst the many other panels that are happening. Your story must be heard. So she started to record her story, and it was so heavy that she couldn't even record it in one go. She had to break it up. And eventually, we got the recording, and we do intend to actually play this at the conference. And, subhanAllah, please make dua for me, we're flying in from the West Bank, the Palestinian Minister of Mental Health, Dr. Samah Jabbar, inshallah, to make voices that are not heard clear and accurate. And in the very places that are denying these stories. Make dua for me, please, <laughs> inshallah. These stories, like Dr. Shema and Dr. Samas and so on, when I tell you empathy, the psychology of empathy, you can hear a story like this and we can tear up and we can say, la ilaha illallah. But until you feel the pangs of hunger, until you're so thirsty that you can understand what that felt like for the sisters and brothers in Gaza, currently, still happening. It cannot happen without something like Ramadan. This is why Ramadan comes as a tathir, as a cleansing. It comes to purify, to renew, to refresh, to allow you to get to the rest of the year, able to handle whatever comes at us, subhanAllah and to still say with full conviction and iman, la ilaha illallah, Muhammad al-Rasulullah. We pray, as I close here, I want to say, we pray for, deeply, our sisters and brothers in Gaza, in Palestine, all of it, and all of the other parts of our ummah that are hurting, that are ailing, that are oppressed, that are tribulated at this moment. And we pray that this fasting, this month of fasting, isn't just a purification for us, but it's a fortification to allow our du'as to actually have the impact they're meant to have. Please remember these sisters and brothers in your prayers, in your du'as, when you come to break your fast every single night of Ramadan. Remember that these du'as that you make for them, behind their backs, they don't know, are more likely to be accepted that if they knew. And remember too, that we need their du'as more than they need ours, subhanAllah. I close here by saying and asking, as I think the announcements were made, mashallah, that MCC, mashallah, has been a wonderful sponsor to many things, one of which is Madistan, the nonprofit that is supporting all these mental health efforts that I'm referring to. And alhamdulillah, we actually have our own office here in Madistan in this building, that's Allah. The close of the conference, there is a gala. It's a benefit dinner. And I know many of you were sad that Sheikh Mikael couldn't come tonight, but he'll be here exactly a week from now at the gala. He's actually the keynote speaker at that gala, inshallah, along with Sheikh Tariq Muslah, who you heard from earlier. So please do come out to the gala. There's a few more tickets left. We do need your support, inshallah. Please support the efforts around mental health and Muslims and allow, inshallah, to grow here and allow us, inshallah, to continue building this legacy, reviving, really, a legacy of Islam and mental health that's always been part of our tradition, that we Muslims have what modern psychology is attempting to teach. It's already part of our tradition. We just have to be able to practice it, pull it up, revive it, and use it to our benefit, inshallah ta'ala. So, inshallah, I think that they're going to, you'll be putting an announcing, inshallah, right. about it, Brother Munir. And with that, I'll close, and let Brother Munir make his announcement. Barakallahu feekum. 
please keep us in your prayers. Baraka fikum miftah program and to all those who have benefited from this, from all of you. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa sallallahu ma'ala al-hadi Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam ajma'in.